The NTSB has released its preliminary report on the April 10, 2025 crash of an Aronka 7AC champion near Cape Fair, Missouri, a flight that began as a routine recreational outing and ended in tragedy just minutes after takeoff. With clear weather and no flight plan filed, the aircraft departed a private grass strip with two occupants aboard and crashed into a ravine after striking power lines, resulting in one fatality and one critical injury. Everything happened so quickly. Now let's break it down to see if we can get anything from the report. The aircraft at the center of this tragic event was a 1946 Aronka 7AC Champion, tail number November 83952. This aircraft is a relic from the post Wubwee Wu boom in general aviation, a time when manufacturers built simple, affordable planes to meet the soaring interest in personal flight. Known affectionately among pilots as the Champ, the Aronka 7AC is a tandem seat high wing tail dragger. It is light, agile, and uncomplicated, making it a favorite among recreational pilots and flight schools for basic training. November 83952 was powered by a Continental C85 engine, a four-cylinder air-cooled piston engine producing about 85 horsepower. While modest by modern standards, this engine is reliable and well-matched to the lightweight airframe, which has an empty weight of roughly 740 pounds. The aircraft is designed for two occupants seated in tandem, one behind the other, and it lacks many modern features common in contemporary general aviation planes. Most notably, it was not originally equipped with electrical systems, meaning there was no onboard lighting, transponder, or starter motor unless retrofitted later. It also lacks safety tools like a stall warning horn or angle of attack indicator, devices that today are considered standard for situational awareness and stall prevention. The airplane was registered to Lonnie R. Asher and Diane D. Asher, both residents of Cape Fair, Missouri, the same community where the flight originated. The aircraft's registration had been renewed as recently as 2023, suggesting it was considered airworthy at that time. There were no known mechanical defects on record. This aircraft's vintage simplicity is both its charm and its limitation. While the 7AC Champion has long earned respect as a rugged, forgiving trainer, its lack of modern safety enhancements can leave little margin for error, especially during low-altitude operations in complex terrain. In this case, those very design limitations may have contributed to the outcome, as we'll explore further in the analysis section. But before we get there, let's take a closer look at the two men aboard the flight, the pilot and his passenger. Aboard the ill-fated flight were two local residents of Cape Fair, Missouri, both well-known and respected members of their small community. The pilot in command was Lonnie Ray Asher, 68 years old. A lifelong aviation enthusiast, Mr. Asher co-owned the Aronka 7AC with his spouse and often flew recreationally from his private airstrip. He was known for his passion for flying and his active participation in local aviation events, a familiar face in a tight-knit circle of general aviation pilots in the Ozarks. Asher held a private pilot certificate. However, records indicate that his last FAA medical certificate was issued in 1988, suggesting that he may have been operating under basic med privileges or possibly flying under the light sport aircraft exemption. While neither scenario would have necessarily prevented him from legally flying the Aronka, it does raise questions about whether age-related limitations, regulatory compliance, or medical readiness could have played a role in his performance on that day. Mr. Asher survived the crash but suffered critical injuries. He was airlifted by emergency responders to a hospital in Springfield, Missouri for immediate medical treatment. As of the time of the preliminary report, his condition remained serious. Seated behind him was Barry Wachowski, a 76-year-old longtime friend of the pilot and a beloved figure in the Cape Fair community. Mr. Wachowski was not a pilot. He was simply along for the ride on what should have been a relaxing morning sightseeing flight. Tragically, he did not survive the impact. He was pronounced dead at the scene. With a clearer understanding of who was on board, we now turn to the sequence of events that led to the crash. The final moments of the flight unfolded swiftly and with chilling clarity, according to GPS data retrieved from the aircraft's Stratus receiver. After departing from the pilot's private grass airstrip at 8.42 a.m., the Aronka 7AC meandered casually over the rural terrain, its path irregular and consistent with a relaxed recreational outing. This was not a structured flight with navigational objectives. It was the kind of loop a pilot flies simply to enjoy the view and the sky. 
But as the aircraft approached the area west of Flat Creek Road shortly after 9 a.m., its flight path began to shift. A right turn toward the southeast was immediately followed by a left turn to the southwest, and it was during this maneuver that something critical occurred. The plane began a descent, leveled off low, and proceeded to fly down a narrow valley. This is where risk escalates dramatically. Flying low in terrain-constrained areas introduces several dangers. Visibility of obstacles becomes limited, and pilot reaction time is compressed. Valleys, in particular, often conceal power lines, ridge lines, and wind shifts that may not be apparent until it's too late. In this case, a set of high-voltage power lines spanned the valley, invisible hazards strung across the pilot's path like a tripwire in the sky. Witness testimony supports this reconstruction. A nearby resident, a friend of both the pilot and passenger, was operating an excavator on his property when he briefly saw the aircraft overhead. Minutes later, he saw it again, this time out of the corner of his eye. And this time, it was crashing. The airplane struck the wires, shearing through them, before plunging into a wooded ravine on private land. The aircraft came to rest beneath the damaged power lines. Although the lines were spliced by the utility company afterward, they had not fallen to the ground. A haunting detail that highlights just how subtle and deadly such obstacles can be, especially when flying at low altitude. There was no post-impact fire, no explosion, just wreckage, silence, and a rapid emergency response. First responders arrived quickly, airlifting the critically injured pilot and confirming the death of the passenger at the scene. The FAA and NTSB were both notified, and an investigation was launched that day. At first glance, this may seem like a tragic misjudgment, a pilot miscalculating the elevation of wires or underestimating the hazard of flying low. But as we'll explore in the next section, there may be deeper operational and human factors that shape the outcome of this flight. With the NTSB's final report still pending, it's important to emphasize that what we're offering here is an early stage analysis grounded in the available facts from the preliminary report, supported by broader aviation context, and shaped by similar cases we've studied. While the full picture is still developing, some early patterns are beginning to emerge. First, and perhaps most critical, is the collision with high-voltage power lines. The wires struck by the aircraft were stretched across a valley, suspended above rising terrain, and likely difficult to detect from the air. According to the preliminary report, the utility company had to splice two damaged wires afterward, confirming that the aircraft made direct contact with them. This wasn't a brush or a near miss. It was a high-energy mid-air impact with infrastructure that, like in many general aviation accidents, proved unforgiving. The flight path suggests low-altitude maneuvering in a narrow valley, which inherently limits a pilot's options. When flying at low elevation through constrained terrain, the margin for error narrows to almost nothing. Any visual distraction, momentary lapse in spatial awareness, or unexpected downdraft can have immediate and irreversible consequences. This environment, while scenic, is not forgiving, especially in an aircraft as rudimentary as the Aronka 7AC. It's worth noting that the nature of the flight, recreational, conducted under Part 91, and flown under VFR without a flight plan, can sometimes correlate with more relaxed hazard awareness. These flights are often spontaneous, unstructured, and personal. That's not inherently risky, but it does mean the pilot is solely responsible for terrain clearance, obstacle avoidance, and decision-making without the structure or oversight of a more formal operation. In this case, what may have started as a peaceful morning flight quickly crossed into danger, likely without warning. Mechanically, there's currently no indication that the aircraft was at fault. The airframe and engine showed no signs of pre-impact failure. Flight control continuity was verified. The engine could rotate without difficulty. Fuel was present and clean, and both magnetos generated spark when impact damage was bypassed. These early findings steer the focus toward operational and human factors rather than equipment malfunction. Another point to consider, and one we explored in our earlier coverage of the November 1472 echo crash, is the potential for aircraft overloading. The Aronka 7AC is a small, lightweight airplane designed in an era before many of today's safety margins. Two grown men aboard, combined with full fuel, could place the aircraft near or even beyond its upper performance envelope, especially in warmer temperatures or confined climbouts. In the November 1472 Echo case, overloading played a pivotal role in a fatal accident involving the same model aircraft. If you're interested in learning more about that case and how it compares to this one, we've linked our video on the November 1472 Echo crash in the description below. Finally, it's important to keep in mind that the Aronka 7AC, like many aircraft of its era, 
was not equipped with modern safety devices such as stall warning systems or angle of attack indicators. These tools offer pilots critical cues in high-risk conditions, particularly at low altitude or near stall speeds. Their absence in a low-level turn through a valley leaves little room for error and no warning when that margin is crossed. In summary, while it's too early to draw firm conclusions, the available data point toward a combination of low-altitude terrain maneuvering, obstacle collision, and the inherent limitations of vintage aircraft design as the primary areas of concern. As always, we'll revisit this story once the NTSB publishes its final report, but until then we continue to reflect on another reminder of how even routine flights can demand utmost caution. That's all for today's video. Thank you for tuning in and don't forget to subscribe for more updates.